What's going on team? Welcome back along to part two of the Super Rugby Preview. Today we are having a look at the Australian Conference and it kicks off in about a week's time. Super Rugby is not too far away from getting underway. Again, we've got a special guest joining us to have a look at the teams involved and see how we think we're going to go, who's the big ins, who's the big outs and all the jazz about the five teams in the Australian Conference. Before we get into it, a bit of a shout out. If you missed the South African Conference, you can go check that out with Brett. We did that. Um, it should already be up on the channel. Also, be sure to uh, check out BehindThePost.com because that's where you're going to find anything you want to read about Super Rugby coming up this season. And finally, Super Brew Picks. That is where you want to go to make sure you can um, put your picks in and try and prove all of us wrong that you're a better picker of our uh, Super Rugby games than we are. So the link, of course, um, will be in the description, and there will be a little code that you can go and check out and join up with my Super Brew pool. So make sure you go and do that um, as soon as you're finished watching the video, of course. But today, we are going to be chatting to the resident Australian expert. He's full of confidence um, for a good rugby season, but he's not full of too much confidence for a good Australian season. And of course, it is Shane coming back onto the channel. Shane, thanks for coming on, of course. How are you, sir? It's been a while since we've talked to you. Yeah, it's uh, good to be back, Steve. And, um, you know, we've had a wonderful World Cup and um, we saw the excitement that that, that tournament brought. And now we're, we're back, super rugby time, you know. All the workers in Australia, mate, we're going to fire up the grills on Friday and Saturday night and... And really look forward to a big, big Super Rugby tournament and an interesting year for Australian rugby. It will be indeed. And like I talked about with uh, Brett in, in the South African Conference preview, this is a big year for these nations like Australia, like South Africa, like it is for New Zealand with the World Cup cycle finishing and all these new players coming in now, this this uh, breath of fresh air. It's a chance to start a new, renew that cycle. And um, all those old guys leaving even not the old guys leaving now and now uh, we get to see what the depth is like um in australia and new zealand and in south africa so it's going to be a really interesting part i think about this whole season i think come the end of it later on in the year we're going to be talking about all these new players in all three four five nations um that will certainly be making a, a name for themselves in international rugby uh, later on in, in 2020. So we're going to be having a look at these uh, five sides. We'll kick it off with the four Australian teams, so I think there's a lot more interest in them um, than there is in the fifth Sunwolves um, side, which I think is going to be an instant replay of every year that they've been in Super Rugby. So we'll leave leave that um, drag till last, but we'll, we'll kick things off. And alphabetically-wise, it's always a good one to start with, is the Brumbies. Now, the Brumbies really were... I guess you could call the, the shining light of Australia in 2019, weren't they? By far the best side, topping the conference by 14 points. And they come into this year losing quite a bit of experience, especially um, in the squad. But they have brought in a lot of players as well coming through. The Brumbies, they are certainly the one on everyone's lips uh, to carry on their good form in Australia. Are they the one hope that you've got in the Australian Super Rugby sides, that they're going to continue on that good form we've seen from them last year? Well, historically, they've been called the New South Wales Rejects, which is a very unfair tag, but they <laughs> take that with a badge of honour. Uh, these guys work well with what they've got. And, mate, it's almost like, um, you know, it's they, they fight for every scrap. Um, and... Again, they've got some, some good experience there still with Alatoa and CO, James Slipper. Uh, they're going to lead the forward pack around. Um, the young bloke, um, Will Miller from New South Wales, um, they, they tell me he's got a lot of good skills, similar to Hooper. He's going to be coming down. Um, Kurandrani's there having another crack at things. They've got some good young 10s. Joe Powell will have to really step up his game at, at nine. Uh, they're going to miss Christian Leliafano's leadership and the way he runs the team spirit. But all in all, you, there's, there's a saying in Australia, and we love saying it, you underestimate the Brumbies at your peril. They are very, very dangerous when they are underestimated. You know, I think... Um, 
more dangerous than a koala up a up a gum tree when you're trying to chase him for the eucalyptus leaves. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness me! It wouldn't be it wouldn't wouldn't be a, an Australian conference preview without an analogy like that. Uh, there's the Brumbies one, nice and out of the way. A lot of guys gone throughout the side. A lot of names that many people will uh, recognise, especially the second row. Rory Arnold uh, out off to Toulouse. Sam Carter's off to Ulster. Of course, David Pocock is gone. Uh, Matt Lucas is a guy I think that they probably um, would have quite liked to have kept. Um, in, the, in the scrum house, uh, Lelia Fano, like you've mentioned, Hawera is gone as well. Uh, Chance Penny, Henry Spate, uh, two big names out in that back line uh, that have departed the team. One name that did um, strike me as quite interesting is Solomon Carter, who was a guy that played for the Warriors in the NRL and then went off to the Melbourne Storm. Now um, is with the Brumbies. But the big question mark I've got on this team, I, I don't know, I, it, it's a big question mark around Australian rugby as a whole. It's not just the Brumbies. But that number 10 jumper, they, they really stretched, and I think they got great value out of Lelia Fano last season. But this year, where do you find they're going to find that, that, that this next player? Australian rugby need this next generation of, of fly halves with, the, with all the losses they've received this, uh, over this last offseason. Um, but do you see this being a problem for them? It, really, no experience there at all of anyone who can run the cutter at 10. But that, I think, is the exciting part, Steve. I think that all these young blokes now are going to have to step up and be a part of the system and say, this is me. Um, you know, people didn't perhaps rate, say, Stephen Larkham and, until he um, really got and made that position his own at the Brumbies. Um, so, you know, the success stories that come out of that, that club in particular is because they give blokes a go. And if you give blokes a go and a chance, then you just don't know what they might achieve. Now, in in some cases, we can be proven wrong and say, oh, you know, I thought he was the next big thing or not. Just let them go out and play their game, I feel. And that's, that's the exciting part. Plenty of experience with Joe Fat Powell, who's got over 50 super rugby caps and, and a few wallabies jumpers. So... Um, you know, they'll be they'll have that and, and Kurandrani, um, Tom Banks, uh, Tom Wright. So, so there's there's plenty to work with in that back line if the the right person steps up at ten. Yeah, I, I do like the look of, of what the Brummies have as probably their first choice team. Like you talked about, their front row is very good. It's so much experience here of Alan Thomas, Co. Uh, Slipper, to mention just a few. Um, Fyanga. And, and Mick and Ernie is another guy who actually featured a bit for them last season and, and seemed to actually play quite well um, there. Uh, Murray Douglas probably one of the few with a bit of experience in that second row. I think their back row again, good. Guys, you mentioned Cusack, uh, Miller, Samu is still there, uh, McCaffrey. Plenty of guys that have been there for a, a number of seasons now. And I think it's much like we talked about with uh, Brett yesterday on the um, South African conference is that... Uh, that the core of that team has stayed the same. It's just the depth that has kind of expanded. They've got rid of some guys who were nearing the end. They've got more talent coming in for the future. And I think it's a good way to rotate where these guys are going to just work their way into the team as opposed to just being thrust straight out there um, into a lot of pressure in, in most of those positions. So they look in a good spot, I, I do think. Um, plenty of guys um, that can definitely take the pressure off. And I'm looking at uh, Simone as a guy in that centers position who is going to be the most helpful to whoever takes that number 10 jumper uh, for the Brumbies because he's a guy that can ease off pressure and can cover that uh, first receiver position quite a lot. He's got a good kicking game, um, and he plays like a 10, but he generally wears that 12. So he's going to be a guy I think it's need to get that pressure off those young guys in the number 10 jumper and take some of that on himself, being the experienced guy in that back line. But I do like the look of that starting 15 that they'll put out. So I think that will be a very dangerous side again do you think that they can top the pool? Are you picking them to go number one again in Australia? Yes, I am. And that's nice and simple. That um, that is because I can see what the Brumbies do. I've seen it before. Look at 2017, and people will argue oh, they only won six games, and that's good enough to top Australia's conference <laughs> back back then. But they got a bonus point out of every other game virtually that they played. Um, 
they're, they're a side that chips away, chips away, chips away in the old Aussie way. Um, get out the Shearers um, Clippers, mate, and start Shearing. That's that's the sort of team the Brumbies are. And it's, you know, it's like a horror movie sometimes for the other Australian sides, but it's a dangerous <laughs> horse that you find um, in that uh, creepy room. So look out for the Brumbies. I think they'll top the conference. Yeah, I think this start's going to be equally important as well. And they start at home against the Reds, um, and then they take on the Rebels. So it's two Australian derbies to, to start this season. And if they can pick up those early wins against division rivals, ultimately, uh, that could make their season you know, the start they need. And they'll, I think, fire on from there. A bit of early confidence uh, is all that team needs, and they will certainly be hard to stop. Following that, though, they've got a couple of New Zealand sides um, after that. So... An okay start. I think an important start, uh, definitely, for the Brumby side. We'll move on from them and go to a team that probably should be delivering a bit more um, than they have promised over the last couple of years. It is the Melbourne Rebels again. And a number of changes. I mean, those, those glory days that were promised under the old firm of Will Guinea and Quake Cooper last season. I mean, that's long gone now. Now they've got to look forward um, and they can't keep looking back at, at what was of those two guys there. Uh, I think the big loss here for this Rebels team is one man of Jack Maddox who was left to the Waratahs. That is a guy of genuine quality that will be around in an Australian jumper for a long time, don't you think? Absolutely. I think Jack's a very talented young man and he can, you know, the skills he's got to offer and... Um, off he goes to New South Wales just before the season starts. Well, I've seen a lot of high-profile players go to New South Wales, and well, yeah. <laughs> um, but but a good, genuinely good luck to the young fella. He'll be right. Um, but yeah, you can't afford to lose some of your your roster that far, that close to a Super mm. Rugby season, mate. The, this side, to me. When they play well, they play really well. And then at the end of the seasons, they choke. I mean, uh, you know, what are they having at the end of the season? Peanuts and they choke. <laughs> you know, you almost have to go out and rescue them by thumping them three times on the back. Uh, every one of them. And this is such a critical year. Dave Wessels has has had two chances now with reasonably very good Wallaby-style rosters and failed to deliver the conference win both times. He's got a reasonable side still there, despite some of the big losses of Coleman and and Cooper and Ganier and, um, and, and now Maddox and, and those sort of fellas leaving. But... Really, if they don't finish top two in this conference, well, if they don't finish top, this is a critical time to say, well, what are you really achieving here, Dave? You know, um, with the rosters we're giving you and, and you know, the high-profile players that you have. Um, yeah, so, but I'm, I'm nonetheless excited to see, you know, uh, Frank Lamani, who's going to take over Genia's role in in that nine. Um, you know, Luke Jones is a workaholic around the park. Uh, you know, they've still got DHP at fullback, who's, I think, a reasonable fullback, you know, and he's been serviceable for the Wallabies over the last few years. So it all sets up to be a very interesting season for the Rebels. Yeah, I think they've recruited fairly well. They seem to always recruit fairly well, too. I think they've got good squad players with a bit of experience um, joining the team. Ryan Smith from the Reds, um, one most people are probably quite familiar with. Michael Wells from the Waratahs. Um, another guy I think will, will fit the, the squad um, fairly well. Um, James Tuttle from the, the Reds as well coming in. Andrew Deegan from the Western Force. And uh, Andrew Calloway returning. Um, now, former Waratah, if I'm not too mistaken, um, on that guy. So... They've got a lot of experience coming back into this team, as well as a lot of youth as well, which they seem to bring in quite nicely. Um, overall, again, a strong team in that starting 15, when you look at it by Australian standards. But like you say, come the end of that season, come crunch games, come important times, they just can't seem to get that job done. Um, 
And they need to find guys that are going to really yeah. step up and lead this team from the front. Matt Tamur is a guy I think is going to have a huge amount of pressure on him um, to get this team and lead this team around. But I think they've got the best or the best possible start they could wish for because they start away, which isn't great, but against the Sunwolves. Um, so this is a great opportunity here for the Rebels to really stamp their mark on this season, isn't it? And thrash these Rebels, then go and play the Brumbies, high on confidence, and try to get that initial upset because if they get one over a team like the Brumbies very early, confidence as well as that mental fortitude they could gain from that would be huge for this season, wouldn't it? It would. It would. Um, but but then again, they've, they've started with probably three Australian Conference derbies in a row the last couple of years and then finished against the New Zealand sides where, they, mm. where they've really choked. Um, and, mate, it's like being in the Central Australian outback. You hope you don't see a Western Brown and you're a bush rat. <laughs> but that's how bad it is for the Rebels. The bush rat has to um, make sure he's quick. Um, you know, again, we get to that Waratahs fixture. They've led in so many of those those games, and they've choked. Mm. You know, I've always mentioned it's it's... It's the Bart, Homer, Chainsaw and Hockey Mask incidents all the time with them. Um, they've got to learn to finish games properly. Um, and maybe that's conditioning. Maybe that's tactics. Maybe they start to go to sleep. Um, you know, sleep time's midnight, two and a half hours after the game and you've done your recovery. <laughs> not, not, not halfway... <laughs> Through a, through a rugby match, you know. So those are the things with the Rebels. I still think that they're, in in my opinion, Steve, I reckon they'll finish second again. They'll be the bridesmaid, not the bride. It's, it's really, yeah, I just think they lack something that's that they've continued to lack over seasons past that is uh, probably not going to see them play finals again unless two Australian sides make it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a million-dollar question, is it? How, how they fix that? Is it, is it coaching? Is it this complacency of the players? Or what is it that the problem is? But they need to find some solution. I mean, there's always a weakness somewhere. They do have... Well, the last round they played the Reds. Um, that's going to be interesting. But, I mean, they do play the Chiefs in the penultimate round. And before that, um, they are taking on, of lost in the Brumbies at home. So, a, a tough finish. An, an important finish as well. That could, obviously, like you say, be the difference between them finishing well and finishing poorly, like we have seen in, in recent years. So, the poor Rebels. I'm Now, I've always, in the past, been a, a pretty big supporter of the Rebels and often predicted them to do quite well this year they probably will because i'm going to pre predict them to finish in third um because i've got a bit of a bolter uh which i mean considering we've already talked about two of the teams you can probably half guess who it's going to be coming up but the rebels for me going into third position now with the brumbies obviously in number one so we'll move on to the next side which is the queensland reds now mr big bad brad fawn still at the helm and I don't know what you make of this team here, uh, Shane, but I think he's done a really good job of who he's brought through this team and who he's recruited in to join the Reds this season. Well, James O'Connor's back, um, and we've um, hopefully managed to keep him nice and grounded um, <laughs> on the aircraft to Brisbane. Um, so he might not have to come. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> He'll be there. It's good to see him. I'm really looking forward to seeing Henry Spate run down the mm -hmm. sidelines of Suncorp Stadium. Um, I'm actually hoping to go and see a Reds game this year as well. So Good stuff. Um, Samu Karevi's obviously going to be missed. His season was outstanding at Super Rugby level last year. I don't think anyone's denying that at all. Um, I think, you know, they've got some very good forwards. Um you know, Liam Wright and Ryder and Tongan Thor, um, Taniela Tupo, um, Brendan Payanga Ramosa. Um, Caleb Tima is going to be another loss. Um, he, he did quite well over the last couple of seasons. But if I could state, um, 
Brad Thorne does bring the best out of the young fellas, and I think the young fellas are um, heeding that call. Uh, six wins for me for the last two seasons, as well as them being very competitive in just about every game last year, is not a bad thing for the Reds. And I think that a lot of Reds fans have been a little critical of Thorne, I think, but I think that it, overall... The Reds haven't been too bad, and I don't think they'll be too bad this year either. I think this is a a useful list, and um, you know, obviously, the lads, are, like any team, have to go out there and play. But if they go out and play with their potential and be competitive, then they're every chance of picking up a win here and a win there, and restore continuing that pride and a jumper that I've certainly seen over the last couple of years. Yeah, this is what you've talked about already. It's the youth, I think, in this side. Because they've got all these guys that are actually making a name for themselves, I guess, um, like the Isaac Rodders and guys like him, especially up there, and they're now good Super Rugby players, and they're still so young, uh, and so many more of them coming through, and these guys are going to be around for a long, long time. They're going on to internationals now, and they're still here. It's not like they're coming in and they're just grabbing the 33-year-olds. I'm sure there's a couple of them. But ultimately, their team is based around that sort of thing, which thing is really, really good. Um, and it, it builds a good future for the team. And they can build on that. They're just going to get better and better. I'm, I'm looking forward to the side. I, like, I look at that back line, and there's a lot of players that are really dangerous. Yep, Karibi was, I think, one of the players of the tournament last year. But big things have to come out of O'Connor. Of course, huge pressure is going to be on Henry Spate to perform. Um, when he kind of did... He was good for the Brumbies, but he kind of just coasted along with the team who played pretty well. He's going to have to actually find the work, I think, this year and, and make his worth really told for the Reds. But another guy, Jordan Pattaya, he's massive. Um, what he can actually bring to this team, if he stays injury-free, he's going to be the golden boy of Australian rugby for a long, long time. So a really exciting-looking back line for this Reds team. A young, and I think a pack that has learned so much under the tutelage of Brad Thorne. That is where this Reds team is going. And, I mean, if you probably haven't guessed it already, these are the guys that I'm kind of shock-picking to finish second in the Australian Conference because I think this team is just going to go better and better. And you've already said it, Shane. They, last season, were never out of a match. They never gave up. They never throw it away. They never they never waratahed it like they do so badly. Uh, when things are going bad, they just chuck it out the window. Uh, this Reds team is just full-on and high-capacity, really good team. And I'm expecting the big things out of them. Do you share my thoughts, though? Where are you picking the Reds to finish? Third. I think I think they'll. I think that it'll be a, a three-way race for third, <laughs> third and fourth. But I think I think they'll do enough to finish third. And yeah, just just scrap in there. Um, and that's what I like from from the Reds. Can I make one observation, Steve? I think that even though Players like um, Tate McDermott certainly came out of the woodwork last year and had a really good season and Karevi. Mm -hmm. um, I know Brad Thorne's a big fan of Ford's heavy, where someone like myself, um, who's heavy, um, is a fan of backs <laughs> light. Um, you know, I like to see some more backline entertainment um, this year from, from the Reds. One of the good reasons were, was they were so competitive is you've got to have good forwards. So if those good forwards can keep up the job, but the backs can really put on a, a real show as well, uh, you know, I'm gonna we're going to enjoy some good rugby, some good scrapping rugby from the Reds. They'll be right. I, I agree. Yep, I think they're going to be a team that's going to be one to watch because um, they're going to get that platform, I think, from that pack. They're going to get the, the go forward ball. They're going to be nicely in action and if they can get some continuity through these guys who are explosive I mean the more we see of guys like Moses Sarovi as well another one who's electric McDermott you've talked about he's really sharp um, and, and again another young uh, fly half as well Carter Gordon um, which is around 19 20 years old so he's going to be potentially another uh, big shining light for Australian rugby which they need more in that number 10 jumper uh, so I'm expecting big things from the Reds I, I was impressed and disappointed with them all at the same time last season, how well they stayed in games, how well they played despite having such a young squad. Um, but it was just a bit disappointing they couldn't quite finish the job. Mentally, 
Are they more in it than the Rebels? That's where we will see as the season wears on. Speaking of not mentally with it, <laughs> we'll talk about the Waratahs next, shall we? Um, the headless chickens of Super Rugby. Is it going to be a, another season or that of that form? Or do you think Rob Penny, who's coming to replace um, the release Daryl Gibson, will make a big change for this Waratah side? I don't think it's going to be a difference whether it's Daryl <laughs> or Rob. Um, and I, I respect what Rob Penny has done in the game and his work with Canterbury and his work in Japan. And I certainly, um, and you know, I'm sure he had a, a playing career as well. That, um, you know, I respect that. Um, but the Waratahs and the Blues, one thing is similar. They both wear blue and they give their fans the same <laughs> colour. Um, you know, they... Um, I think it's going to be more heartache and pain for the Waratahs and their fans this year. They're just so inconsistent. Um, their, their glory days of 2014, 2015, where they top the conference, won a title, were top four the next year. That's over. Mm. Um, in fact, it's more over than any one number one hit from <laughs> that that um, never got heard after that, you know, whoever played that. Um, you know, it's... it's <laughs> the, the Waratahs, to me, have to now go to some youth they have to be patient with those youth. For goodness sake, they got a good club half, a good 10 in Mac Mason. Now, this bloke's a former Australian under 20, Wallaby. Um, he's a very good club 10 for Randwick. Um, not only that, let me tell you, he's world-class trained. And people go, what? Because he was trained with the Melbourne Storm um, and has played in his role um, as a young half in rugby league alongside Cameron Smith, Cooper Cronk and Billy Slater. That tells you he's got a lot of composure and um, he's, not, he's not going to be phased by anything that is put in front of him. He just need, needs the chance. Now, I've heard strongly and that they want to go with Beal with 10. Well, Beal hasn't played a good game at 10 since the Wallabies beat Argentina and Rosario in 2012. <laughs> Beal is a fullback. You've got to let the man play his natural game. And when he does, you can set the world alight because... But, but you know, you're going to have to... There's some big losses in the forwards. Michael Hooper's relinquished the captaincy to mm -hmm. focus on his Wallabies captaincy. So Rob Simmons takes over. Um, a new coach, a new captain, and maybe even a new era for the, the Waratahs. Let's hope for their sake and those that live in New South Wales that they do you proud. Um, but this year I can just see some losses coming. And, mm. and I think the Sunwolves will even go toe to toe with them like they did last year. Oh, oh, oh! That's interesting. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, a lot, a lot of players have oh, that old would have left, haven't they, uh, of the Waratahs side? So, Fibs and Foley, the old firm, nine and ten, um, they've departed. Adam Ashley Cooper, what a surprise! <laughs> um, they've actually released him. Uh, Curtis Rona, I thought, was quite good for them last season. Uh, he has departed this side as well. A lot of names gone for the Suarez team. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, they do have a bit more continuity. Um, I think that, well, we're going to see if the problem was with this team was the as blamed Daryl Gibson or whether it is this group of players. Uh, we're going to quickly find out as well of this team what they're made out of. Plenty of them stayed on, though. They could be exciting, depending if they play guys in the right positions. We've talked about a lot during the World Cup. Teams playing their best 15 players rather than their best player in each position. You've touched on that a bit uh, with, with currently Beal already, where he's going to affect this team. Um, but they do need to put a little bit of trust in some of these youngsters going through um, in, into this new season. They start, <laughs> they start their campaign, get this, against the Crusaders in round one. Um, that's... Is 
Well, that, that's the toughest way to start any campaign, isn't it, for any side. Then they take on the Blues. So it, it's pretty hard, and it gets a little bit easier from there on in uh, for the Waratahs. But they take on the Rebels, which is going to be a pretty decisive fixture for um, them that season. And then they got the bye in round four as well. So interesting start. Their first three rounds is going to be really crucial for this Waratahs side. Yeah, you don't sound too confident in what this team's going to do. And, and you got me a little bit intrigued when you said that you think the Sun was going to run for their money. Are you, are you going to flirt with the option that the Sunnels might actually finish above them in the table? Oh, I've reluctantly oh. said four. <laughs> uh, but to be honest, this side deserves to finish fifth every year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or last on the table when they go back to the round robin system <laughs> next year. The Waratahs do not excite me. Um nor, as a Queenslander, do they scare me um, when they go <laughs> on the park. Um, I'm being critical because the last four years have been rubbish mm. for a side that's had it all. The talent roster that they have wanted and they have made terrible blunders in games, um, they've... They have no one to blame but themselves. And, and you know, even I love the Blues uh, and watching them play in the New Zealand Conference. But when the Blues go through their issues like they do every year, um, they, have, they don't have anyone to blame but themselves either. So I wish them luck. I really do. Um, I think Jack Maddox will be a shining light but um, as a recruit. And, and I just hope that Rob Penny... We'll go with the youth, give them a chance, and um, as well as having a good team of senior players around them that can help mould perhaps something for the future. Indeed. We will find out what these Waratahs are made out of um, in a week's time at least, won't we? This could be a interesting game because, I mean, the Crusaders have sometimes started these seasons a bit rusty, so... Maybe that's the best time to play them uh, for any Waratahs fans out there clutching at a few straws heading into the start of the season. We'll move on to the final side of the Australian Conference. We've talked a little bit about them already, the Sunwolves. Now, to be honest with you, Shane, I'm not going to talk about the, Sh the Sunwolves outs because we'll probably be here till you know tomorrow afternoon <laughs> talking about all the players that have left um, this outfit and equally so players that have come in. So... Anyone that people may recognise um, in this team, I'll go through some ins that are probably uh, you know well-known players. Uh, in the props, Chris Eves, Conrad Van Vuren uh, from the Bulls, uh, Chris Eves from the Hurricanes, uh, probably the two biggest uh, names. There's a couple there from um, the My Team Cup as well, Jared Adams, uh, Sione Assi as well from 102, uh, and Adams from Auckland that people may know if they do follow it quite closely. Uh, upper side from the Blues uh, and Marfu from the Reds and the Hookers. Uh, looking through the rest of it, not too many in the locks. Uh, they still do have uh, Tom Rowe staying in the team, though, from last season. One, one of the very few retained players. Uh, ben Hine from the Brumbies is probably one that Australians will recognise the name. In the back rows, M Mitch Jacobson, um, one from the Chiefs, Brendan O'Connor, uh, did play Super Rugby in the past, but his Hawks Bay time is uh, his most recent playing. Jake Schatz, another one familiar from the Reds uh, a few seasons ago. Spent some time at London Irish, now with the Sunwolves. Um, in the back line, Rudy Page is probably the big name. Um, the former South African player coming from Clermont, uh, joining the team. And, and having, a, a, I guess, a, a countryman alongside him in Garth April, the former Shark. Uh, coming from his playing time in, in Japan, joining the Sunwolves team as well. JJ Ingelbrichts completes, I guess, a, a South African little uh, triple threat there uh, into the midfield. And, and Ben Teo from Toulon. Now, that's one we should talk about as well. Uh, Jordan Jackson Hope from the Brumbies. Uh, who else we got of any note? James Dargaval. It's another one, former Brumby as well. A lot of former players in here um, for the Sunwolves team. That's really the biggest names that I would recognise in this team. A lot coming uh, from, obviously, um, the domestic scene around the world. Um, in New Zealand, in Australia, in Japan, and in South Africa for that matter as well. And a new coach as well, Tony Brown going back to the Highlanders, which is great. I'm more than happy about that. Uh, and they've got Okubo uh, coming in from the assistant coach. 
to coach the side as the head coach now. So a lot of names to go through there. You probably say they'll, they'll name a team of recognisable players uh, from what they've picked up. But uh, I'm most interested in what you think of Ben Teo. Uh, coming from to, uh, Toulon, that, that's a pretty big signing, isn't it, for the Sunwolves? Yeah, look, Ben, ben Teo as well, um, with his achievements before that, even in rugby league. Um, he's, he's had some success in rugby league, particularly with Queensland State of Origin and um, South Sydney and, and Brisbane. Um, so he might bring a an experienced head um, to to the the playing roster. Um, April um, is is obviously quite an experienced um, player as well. Mm. But uh, the Sunwolves, while they are very entertaining, they just um, they just haven't. You know, this is their their final year, which is disappointing. Um, but maybe Japan are focusing on um, their domestic season rather than Super Rugby as well. So th there may be a positive in them leaving, I don't know, but um, as well as a chance for other players to impress and maybe find themselves on Super Rugby lists in Australia and, and, and New Zealand. So so this is going to be, a, yeah, look, it's going to be an interesting year. Um, players... It's going to be a whole new team again, a whole new coaching setup, a whole new tactics and ideas. I just, without seeing them play, Steve, I, I can't make the boldest of predictions other than perhaps to say they they won't set the conference on fire. It's hard to say, isn't it? Because, yeah. like say, it's a whole new side. It's like they're just joining for the first season on paper they can look all right. There's a, quite a number of names there that at this sort of level should perform quite well. But you've got South Africans, you've got New Zealanders, you've got Australians, you've got, well, all sorts of Englishmen. Um, you've got all sorts going on in that team. And, of course, the local players, the Japanese players in there that will be scattered um, throughout as well, the ones that actually do get allowed to play there. So it's a really multicultural sort of thing. I put the way they played last season down to Tony Brown. The way he coaches is something I think they're going to miss. That exciting, um, risk-taking, expansive sort of rugby. That, that's, that's Tony Brown. And that's his play style. And I think hopefully we should see that from the, the Highlanders this season instead. A bit more um, than, than, than the Sunwolves, I think, may go maybe back to a more sort of generalized style um, this season without knowing really what, what they're going to change or what they're going to bring. A uh, different team, I think Garth April's going to be a bit more of a uh, a, a kicking sort of a team. His running game with the Sharks was probably a bit limited when he played in Super Rugby, so what he's going to bring to the side's going to be a bit different. But there's a bit of continuity there, I think, 9 and 10, um, and into that midfield as well. So could be a little bit of something happening there if they do hit their straps on that way. It's it's hard. It is hard. It's very difficult to know what these guys are going to bring in. It, it's kind of sad it's going to be their last season but I think what's sadder is that they don't fool this team with Japanese internationals. Like, why isn't 90% of that World Cup squad playing in the Sunwolves, just like the Jaguares do um, with the Argentinian internet, uh, national side as well? So that's what kind of disappoints me the most about the Sunwolves. And, and the opportunity that they've kind of worked towards, I don't think they've taken it as well as they could. So it's all disappointing for me with the Sunwolves a bit um, last season. They were good. They were exciting. They were fun to watch. Do you have anything else you want to add about the Sunwolves? Because it's a bit of a, a blind stab in the dark, isn't it? Yeah, look, um, I don't know what more I, I could add because I'd, I'd like to see how they'd go in the first few games. And a good test will be next Saturday afternoon against the Rebels. So, you know, mm -hmm. after the barbecued lunch and a few solos <laughs> and we, we get into it and watch some rugby. Um, you know... I agree with you. I, I wish a lot of the Japan um, side was playing for this Sunwolf side um, because the way the Japanese played in the Rugby World Cup was, for me, one of the stories of the Rugby World Cup and how yeah. magnificent it was to see them make the quarterfinals. I'd hate for a, a backward step to be taken now. I hope that Tony Brown actually does a bit more work with, with Japan um, as well as the Highlanders. But, um, you know, it's going to be... 
um, it was going to be interesting. <laughs> You've summed it up. You've summed it up brilliantly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, their season season could be tough. I mean, the best chance for them is when they're at home uh, in Japan. They get a huge crowd. Uh, they love it. Uh, they enjoy the occasion. They love the game. And, I mean, we've seen it with their domestic competition as well. Just um, how fantastic that support is. I mean, this is just um, their domestic game. And it, it, it's packed. It's just absolutely packed. And they've got all the superstars uh, playing there as well. Just quality, quality teams um, throughout that competition. So... You know, what could have been, I guess, the Super Rugby's loss is um, Japan's game domestically. So that's the way they want to go. We will see how that plays out for them in the, in the future. But hopefully it doesn't affect, like, say, their national side. So I'm um, predictably for picking them to finish fifth. I presume we're doing the same. Yes. Yep. Nice and simple, nice and easy. So that, that's really Australia in a nutshell. Um, kind of a bit of a downer way to finish it with the old Sunwolves, isn't it? It's a bit of a disappointing way to go, but it's going to be an interesting season. I think surely Australia has to be better than they were last year. Uh, they've got to improve. They've got to really step it up another gear and, and become contenders this season like everyone else has. Um, Australia, are you looking forward to the season, Shane? You're looking forward to a bit more positivity overall for, for Australia leading into the Wallabies internationally? You think they're going to collectively Honor of some few gems. Uh, with with the Wallabies, I still have my concerns, um, as I do every year. Um, for, you know, for the last probably four years after the the, the twenty fifteen, and let's face it, twenty fifteen was quite a successful year for the Wallabies, winning the rugby championship and finishing runners up in the in the World Cup. Um, with I've got to say, a team that. A lot of that came from you and Mackenzie and Checker was lucky to have done so well at the Tars and was was ready by then. Um, you know, as much as I respect Michael Checker's contribution in the game, it was time to move on and he knew that. He probably knew that a year earlier. <laughs> um, you know, but I wish him well in, in France where he'll, he'll be coaching and he's a good club coach and he'll, he'll get the best out of his troops there. But I'm not so convinced with Dave Rennie yet. Um, he's come out of the Scotland system that, um, and, and, you know, Scotland didn't even make the quarters um, of the, the Rugby World Cup. And, and but, you know, I think that we need to take some wise counsel from from senior states people in Australian rugby and, and say this is the areas we need to fix and fitness is one of them. Um, finishing off games is another and as well as our, our, the way we play rugby, we can't keep playing the 91-92 style of the, the Wallabies were so successful with anymore. I know it's the way that the Wallabies have won rugby matches in the past, but um, look at Dave Rennie and, and, and the Chiefs' tactics were zigzag, zigzag on angle line running. If we can get the Wallabies fit enough in Super Rugby, then maybe it's worth trying a new tactic and, and a new way. So there's, there's a lot of new ways this year. It's going to be absolutely fascinating and... And the grills, um, the grill will be fired up on Friday night. <laughs> uh, looking forward to it. Uh, as always, Shane, thanks so much for coming on and giving your thoughts on your dearest Australian uh, players and teams. Um, we'll put your Twitter uh, handle under your um, little square over there if anyone wants to get in touch with you. But anything else you want to add um, before we wrap up for the Australian Conference? No, but uh, hope you hope you. Enjoy the rugby this year, and uh, Australia, we love you. <laughs> very good, sir. Thanks very much for your time, and thanks everyone for tuning in and watching, um, as per always. Uh, remember to do those things at the start. Uh, go join up uh, with Super Brew and all that sort of jazz as well, and we will see you for the one remaining conference, which is the New Zealand Conference. Um, promises to be another big year of Super Rugby. We'll see you for that one. Until then, though, take care.